Hello, everyone. We continue our, our series of talks with the nominees for the Global Energy Prize. And today, our guest is uh, Professor Ip Chorkindov, Director of the Willem Center for Sustainable Fuels and Chemicals. Hello. Hello. Professor Chorkindov was nominated for giving the fundamental aspects of important catalytic processes focusing on finding catalysts that will enable in, in industrial processes to be less polluting, produce pure, pure products and last longer. So correct me if I'm wrong, sir, but catalysts are one of those things that few people think much about, but they are all around us. They turn milk into yogurt, oil into mm. plastic products, but more vital, it is a tool for achieving uh, Denmark's uh, ambitious plans for climate neutrality by 2050 in what way catalyst can help here? As you know, a catalyst is not in, it's converting things that should have happened anyway, and it's just happening faster. That's what a catalyst really do. And uh, the, the thing when, when we look into 2050 and wants to become fossil free, we will still use a lot of energy. And that energy will naturally come from sun and wind as being sustainable and that means it comes as electricity and a lot of uh, processes can be electrified for instance we will drive in electrical cars with batteries uh, many of the industrial processes instead of using oil for heating uh, or coal we will actually use electricity but one thing about electricity although extremely efficient is it's very difficult to be stored so we need to aerate out seasonal aerating. When it, the sun is not shining, the wind is not blowing, we will need to have energy. So we need to learn how to store electric energy in the form of chemical energy. And catalyst is essential for that. There's another issue with going electrified. And that is that there are regions, uh, areas in industry that can certainly not be electrified. We are not gonna fly on a batteries. If we want to have any long haul uh, flying or aviation, we need still gasoline in the form we know it today. So we'll need to make that. And there's a number of other processes where that is the case. So we still need to convert, for instance, CO2 and electricity into fuels. And finally, there's the entire chemical industry uh, which supplies with all the chemicals we know today, all the pharmaceuticals and so on, we still need also to be able to manufacture that. Today, that is done from fossil fuels. We actually need to do that again, using electricity as the energy source and then having CO2 and water, and then we can basically build up everything as we know it today. But catalysis is essential for that. The Green Agenda has formed the opinion that coal is the dirtiest product in the energy sector. But is there still a place for coal in the uh, energy of the future? What about uh, the steam reforming then? Uh, the steam reforming is still uh, based on methane. Uh, I don't think coal as such, uh, if you mean black coal, carbon, I don't think that has much future. But uh, methane could have because we can convert CO2 uh, by capturing it from point sources that might be by burning biomass, um, it might be uh, from concrete production, and eventually we may have to drag it out of the atmosphere, but that's very little concentration that is there, only about 400 ppm. But having CO2 and making hydrogen by doing electrolysis of water, by using electricity, we can still build methane, and then methane could have a role as an energy uh, storage, because it's, uh, very efficient to store energy in the form of methane. Uh, as we know today, we have a net, a grid of natural gas, and that by that we can actually transport a lot of energy. Uh, for instance, you know, there's the Nord Stream uh, gas uh, connection from Russia to Europe. It's about 90 gigawatt. Uh, you could also do that with the hydrogen without converting into C, uh, to, to methane, but then we would actually have uh, energy density of only roughly one third. So methane as such could have a role, but I think uh, that will be phased out a lot because if you can just, a lot of the methane, we actually do by steam reforming, making hydrogen, 
And if you instead can just make the hydrogen from water by electrolysis, well, then we don't need to go over methane any longer. It's only when transport coming in and storage, it's actually becoming important. Yes, uh, the Denmark, uh, which has a last uh, percentage of uh, renewable energy sources, can afford to produce uh, green hydrogen. But uh, Russia, for example, as you said, we live on natural gas and coal, and it is cheaper for us to use it, uh, especially when we have uh, technologies that allow to reduce emissions. So what do you think about this? Yes, uh, but in the long run, uh, if you want to become fossil free, and that's what we are discussing here when we look out in 2050, 2060, uh, because uh, there is no doubt that we have an, an environmental issue with letting out CO2 in the atmosphere. We have to reduce that. Uh, and then uh, we have to look into renewable energy sources. So in a transition period, one should get away from coal, go over methane because that lets out less CO2 uh, per energy amount, but eventually, what I think we are looking into in the future, where we will not use fossil resources any longer at all. So carbon capture is uh, not enough anyway. Well, um, I have a little bit, uh, if you mean uh, carbon capture by CO2 capture, uh, then, uh, well, then you, you, um, you can do that eventually, but I think, uh, the best sources of capturing CO2 for using it is from point sources like uh, burning biomass and concrete production, because there you can achieve much higher concentration than dragging out of the atmosphere. One could naturally also, uh, I don't know if that's what you're alluding to, uh, convert methane into carbon and hydrogen and then uh, store the carbon again. Um, that is also a way of using the natural resources without actually letting out additional CO2 to the atmosphere. That's certainly also a route. And people are also looking into that. Another interesting topic is uh, ammonia. It is considered a promising shipping fuel, but uh, we have not yet uh, even come to the transport on hydrogen to the extent that we are talking and talking and talking about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, is ammonia like a far, far utopia? No, I don't think so. Um, ammonia actually has some uh, pretty good uh, energy content. Uh, and for instance, uh, one bottle of ammonia can replace, uh, is it five bottles of hydrogen uh, at, at a pressure of 200 bars and the ammonia is a much lower pressure, it's like 27 or so. So that's why it's actually co being considered for shipping fuel because it has a relative high energy density and, and you may not want to sail around with compressed uh, hydrogen. Uh, so that's why that's interesting. What are other good uh, examples of sustainable solutions for the transition to uh, the carbon neutrality? But, but right now here, and most importantly for developing countries that uh, you know, they exist on a fossil fuel. Well, that, that, that could be actually to do electrolysis. Uh, many developing countries actually have a lot of access to electricity. Uh, if they can afford to set up PV elements that capturing the sunlight, and then they could in principle do electrolysis and put the hydrogen back into the net when they're not shining any longer and use fuel cells and have electricity in that manner. Uh, that is uh, more on the uh, sort of very delocalized uh, level. Another level that we also recently have investigated and published about is, for instance, when you do steam reforming, you, you basically burn a third of your methane uh, to generate the energy to convert the methane and water into hydrogen and CO2. And uh, that uh, amount can actually be removed by using electricity instead. So we can show that you, for instance, can reduce a steam reforming plant to uh, roughly uh, have a volume of uh, a hundredth of those we know today, because they're basically huge ovens. By electrifying them, you can actually make them much smaller and you can also save roughly 90% uh, um, of the catalyst. So all that kind of stuff can already be implemented today and is being implemented. We are collaborating with a company, Halder Topsø, 
lying here close by to DTU, which is actually now starting building reactors based on that principle. Okay, thank you. What about, uh, if it's not a secret, uh, what is Willem Center is uh, up, up to now? So what research is being carried out? Well, the, the main thrust of this center is uh, making water electrolysis more efficient. And actually today it's already up around 70% efficiency. But if we have to produce a lot of hydrogen from, from water, that might be uh, even not enough. We need to bet even better to doing that. Uh, the next, the other two most important ones are converting uh, CO2 uh, by using protons instead of making hydrogen from the, electro from the, uh, from the um, electrolysis. We simply add the protons directly instead of making hydrogen to CO2 and make hydrocarbons or alcohols. And the last thing is actually doing the same, taking the protons and add them directly to nitrogen and make ammonia. Uh, that would be a completely different way of making ammonia, namely doing electrochemically, because then you can do it at ambient conditions, that is at room temperature and one bar. Today, ammonia is made in huge plants because you have to go to 400 degrees C in order to do it. And at 400 degrees C, there's no ammonia unless you have a very high pressure of 100 to 200 bars. And that makes those plants very, very expensive uh, requires a lot of capital to build them and run them. Uh, and therefore also ammonia production is very lo uh, delo uh, sorry, very localized. Uh, there are like 150 plants all around the world. Uh, and that means you have to transport the ammonia uh, a lot around. Um, and in some countries like Africa and developing countries that they simply don't have the infrastructure to handle this ammonia. And therefore they don't have enough for fertilizer. Uh, and if you don't have enough fertilizer, then you have, cannot grow enough food. Uh, so I think one important thing here is to realize we're looking into a future where the energy comes in the form of sun and wind. That means very delocalized. We are using all those products I was talking about, very delocalized. So why not see if we can actually make processes that can also be delocalized? Um, that's sort of the fundamental idea of this. So that's what we are working about, how to make protons, eventually hydrogen if we want, or add the protons to CO2 or nitrogen to make hydrocarbons and ammonia uh, in an other way than we're doing it today and fit into this more delocalized scheme. That's exciting. Thank you very much.